a young lady went to another town for her education and stayed with a friend. What unfolded afterward seemed like a complex story from a detective movie rather than a real-life event. This story troubled law enforcement for quite some time until the surprising truth was revealed. Jenny Anderson was born on July 15, 1985, in the quaint town of Fairview, Arizona. She was a lively and friendly person, always the center of attention at gatherings. In her school years, she was an active member of the local sports team. Upon finishing high school, Jenny joined West Arizona State University, focusing on psychology and crime studies. While studying, she also worked part-time at an educational center for kids. During her time at the university, she met a guy named Mark Thompson. They dated for a few years, and just before graduating in 2006, they got engaged. Jenny, at the age of 21, made a decision to pursue a master's degree in psychology, leading her to temporarily move to Phoenix for further studies. Her time at the Children's Educational Center ignited a passion for this field, and she aimed to specialize as a child psychologist. In the meantime, her boyfriend continued his studies in a different state with the goal of getting a law degree. Even with the distance, they stayed in touch every day and began preparing for their upcoming wedding, which was just a few months away. When she moved to Knoxville for her studies, Jonah arranged her own place to stay. However, in the first few weeks, she stayed at her friend Jason's apartment. They had been classmates with her boyfriend at the university. After they graduated, Jason moved to Knoxville. He had a two-bedroom apartment and was kind enough to let her stay until she found her own place. Jonah found two part-time jobs, one at a jewelry store and another at a children's hospital. On the evening of December 5th, after finishing work at the store, she went to the shopping center to buy Christmas gifts. When she got back home, she packed gifts for the children at the educational center, had a chat with her apartment neighbor, and then went to her room. Later that night, after chatting with her boyfriend on the phone and going to sleep around 4 a.m., Jason woke up to a woman's scream. He thought Jonah had a nightmare and rushed to her room. At that moment, a man came out of the room, and Jason noticed a knife in his hand. The assailant immediately attacked him, delivering several blows. Jason fought back and managed to push the attacker away, allowing him to escape from the apartment. Jason hurriedly rushed to the nearby apartment complex, desperately knocking on every door, hoping that someone would call for help. However, nobody answered. He then sprinted to the closest 24-hour store, almost a kilometer away. The store clerk, shocked to see him covered in blood, immediately dialed 911. Jason quickly explained what had transpired. The police soon arrived at his residence and found Jonah on the floor, barely responsive, near the corridor door connecting five apartments. Paramedics prepared to transport her to the hospital. A police officer inquired if the assailant was still in the apartment, and Jason thought he noticed a slight nod from Jonah. The officers conducted a thorough search but couldn't find the attacker. Jonah was swiftly taken to the nearest hospital, but despite the doctor's efforts, they couldn't save her. Medical experts revealed she had suffered over 20 injuries from a sharp object, leaving little chance of survival. The assailant had also attacked her neighbor, inflicting eight wounds, with one being severe. Luckily, the neighbor's life wasn't in danger. Meanwhile, detectives started examining the crime scene. Bloodstains in the corridor suggested Jonah had tried to seek help from her neighbors, but none had opened their doors. Next to Jonah's room, investigators discovered the weapon, a kitchen knife that belonged to Jason. The assailant had struck with such force that the blade had bent. Additionally, blood traces were found near the back door and on the staircase, indicating the assailant's escape route. Given that Jason and Jonah had exited through the front door, detectives concluded that the assailant had fled through the back door. Another clue emerged in Jason's room, a partial footprint that the perpetrator might have left while following Jason and launching the attack. Given the brutality of the incident involving the young woman, the police suspected that the crime might have a personal motive. They started by closely examining Jana's fiancé, even though he was far away from Knoxville. Everyone close to the couple affirmed their strong relationship, making it difficult to find a motive for him to commit such a terrible act. The fiancé, who was around a thousand kilometers away, learned about Jana's tragic end when her mother called him at 10 a.m. Upon hearing the news, he fainted and took a while to regain composure. He needed help from his neighbor to book a flight and pack his bags because he was too distraught to do it himself. The detectives carefully reviewed his alibi and found it credible. 
he couldn't have physically traveled to Knoxville and back by the morning. Thus, he was ruled out as a suspect, shifting the focus to Jana's neighbor. Unlike the fiancé, the neighbor couldn't provide an alibi. He was present in the same apartment and had the opportunity to commit the crime. Suspicion also arose from the victim's friends and family, with some considering him the likely perpetrator. Others accused him of leaving the apartment, abandoning the young woman. This led the victim's parents to not want him at her funeral. As soon as Jason was released from the hospital, the detectives began questioning him. He recounted the events as follows. He woke up to a scream, saw an unknown man, and was attacked when he managed to push the assailant away. Jason then hurried to the front door and ran outside, attempting to reach the neighbors, believing that Jana had also managed to escape since he no longer heard her screams. However, the police were uncertain about this account. In the beginning, suspicions arose regarding Jason, mainly due to the injuries he had. Seven of his wounds were not severe, and the last one on his right hand could have happened during a struggle, either defending himself or attacking. The experts who study evidence couldn't find signs of someone breaking into the apartment. This suggested that the intruder might have been inside already. Jason mentioned that he took the trash out through the back door that evening but couldn't recall if he had locked it. The detectives asked him a lot about the door he used to leave the building. He said it was the front door, but the police doubted his honesty. If he had gone out through the back door, it could explain the blood near that door on the stairs, implicating him more. Besides, Jason was accused of illegal drug use and distribution, and being aggressive when denied drugs. He denied these accusations, but the investigators kept confronting him. After hours of questioning at the police station, the detectives proposed a polygraph test, and Jason agreed. A specialist conducted the test, and indicated that Jason might not have been entirely truthful. This distressed Jason, and he strongly proclaimed his innocence, fearing for his life as he believed the real criminal was still out there. However, the detectives weren't convinced. They couldn't arrest Jason for the crime because there wasn't enough evidence against him. They needed to wait for the forensic experts to complete their examination of the few pieces of evidence found in the apartment. Then, an unexpected twist in the story happened. On the knife believed to be the murder weapon, they discovered three DNA samples. The young woman who had passed away, Jason, and an unknown male. Shockingly, the unknown male's DNA was also found in Jonah's room on the back door handle and on the staircase the intruder used to escape. Furthermore, a fingerprint covered in the victim's blood was found on the knife handle, and it did not match Jason's fingerprint. The police started having doubts about him being the person involved in the incident. The proof indicated that another individual was present at the apartment that night. However, when they checked the DNA against known records, they found no matches. Even though the detectives stopped considering Jason as the suspect, the public still believed he was guilty. People accused him of leaving his girlfriend and not protecting her. On top of that, Jason began struggling with post-traumatic stress. Soon, an interesting revelation came to light. The person handling the lie detector misunderstood the machine's readings. In reality, there were no signs indicating that Jason was being deceptive. Moreover, there was no concrete evidence linking him to illegal substances. The accusations were a tactic to pressure him. What's crucial is that the severity of Jason's injuries was initially downplayed by the police. In truth, he had suffered severe harm, making full recovery unlikely. Due to these police reports, the insurance company covered only a fraction of his medical expenses. This left Jason in significant financial trouble after he was no longer a suspect. Once Jason was no longer a suspect, the police questioned him as a witness. Based on his account, they created a rough description of the attacker. It was complicated because the room was dark, and Jason couldn't clearly see the attacker's face. The attacker immediately assaulted him as he left the room. Detectives found something interesting in Jonah's room. A cap and scattered discs near the back staircase. Initially, they thought these items belonged to Jonah or Jason. However, Jason denied it. According to him, none of those things were in his apartment, implying that the perpetrator left them behind. The investigators shared an approximate description of the suspect with the media. This led to numerous potential leads as people provided information about acquaintances who remotely resembled the description. Detectives followed up on each lead, and one of them seemed particularly intriguing to a detective. They got a tip that around the time Jonah faced a terrible fate, a gang of young people known for illegal house entries, particularly theft, 
was active nearby. One of them, a 19-year-old named Michael Perkafau, had a resemblance to the suspect description. The police initiated a search for him. It wasn't simple, given Michael was already wanted for theft. But now, being suspected in connection to the tragic incident, the search intensified, involving dozens of officers. Eventually, they located him and brought him in for questioning. The investigators quickly noticed something about Michael's shoes. The pattern on the soles looked similar to the footprint found at the crime scene, left by the assailant. They gathered DNA samples and fingerprints from him, sending them off to the experts. During the interrogation, Michael surprisingly confessed that he and a friend indeed broke into Jonah's place that night. According to him, their aim was theft, but his friend turned violent, attacking Jonah with a knife. However, the detectives found inconsistencies in Michael's account. The provided details didn't match the actual evidence, and there were no signs of two outsiders at the crime spot. Further lab results deepened their doubts. Michael's DNA, fingerprints, and shoe soles didn't match the evidence at the murder site. It became evident that Michael was lying. Oddly, such situations happen frequently. In many high-profile cases, individuals wrongly claim guilt, some seeking attention, and others hoping for rewards or recognition. Michael's motives remained unclear, but his story was proven false. Since then, investigators have interviewed over a thousand potential suspects and gathered about 400 DNA samples. However, they haven't found a match yet. In the early stages of the investigation, a reward was offered for any information leading to the case's resolution. Over time, the reward increased, reaching $60,000 by December 2005, one year after the tragic incident. The governor of the state contributed $20,000 of his own money, grabbing more public attention. Even with many leads, none of them led to solving the case. It stayed unsolved for a long time. In 2007, the parents of the victim decided to push for changes in the state laws. They were surprised that the person's fingerprints and genetic material were not in any databases, considering how severe the crime was. They couldn't believe this was his first crime. Later, they found out that according to Tennessee's laws, fingerprints and DNA samples were only taken from people already convicted of crimes. The parents were determined to change this. They worked on a new law that demanded the collection of these samples from anyone arrested for violent offenses. The authorities supported this, and in May 2007, the law was passed. A few months later, there was a breakthrough. The police arrested a 22-year-old named Taylor Lee Olson for breaking the rules of his parole. He had a record of theft, and during a search of his home, they found marijuana plants leading to his re-arrest. Olson had a long history of criminal activities, mostly theft, check forgery, and stealing cars. He had been arrested several times, but his fingerprints and DNA were never taken until now. Despite living with his girlfriend and their new baby, he continued committing crimes. Investigators had received a tip about his possible involvement in the crime five months earlier, but for some reason, they never collected his DNA for analysis. However, now that he was arrested for violating parole, they finally decided to question him about the case involving Jonah. Olson denied any involvement in the crime and agreed to provide his DNA sample. The experts received it and the detectives soon got a report from the lab confirming that Taylor's DNA was a perfect match to the one found in the victim's apartment. Following this, his fingerprints were taken, and they also matched the marks found on the incident tool. Olson was later apprehended, and the investigators brought him in for questioning. Initially, he denied any involvement, but eventually, he chose to admit. Taylor explained that on that night, he wanted to take John's car and entered the flat through the rear entrance to get the keys. When he entered the young woman's room, she woke up and started yelling. That's when Olson grabbed a kitchen tool and caused harm multiple times. Although he stated he didn't plan to hurt anyone and it happened unintentionally, the detectives had doubts about some parts of his story. They were inclined to think that Taylor had planned the event from the start. It seemed he might have been following the person for a while. This was indirectly supported by a piece of information noted earlier in the inquiry. Jonah's friends informed the investigators that she was followed by someone in a vehicle. At that time, they couldn't find evidence to confirm it. But after Olson's arrest, they considered the possibility that he had indeed been following her. Despite the uncertainty about some details, there was no doubt about Olson's involvement. His DNA and fingerprints were found on the tool used, indicating that he caused the harm. Olson's trial was set to begin in the middle of 2008, 
and by then, he had already employed a legal representative. Evidently, the lawyer advised him to withdraw his earlier admission, and Taylor provided a new version of the incident to the detectives. Now he claimed that he and a friend named Noah Cox were in his apartment together. According to Olson, when he entered Jonah's room to take the car keys, she allegedly woke up, grabbed a tool, and caused harm to him multiple times. Olson rushed out of the apartment through the back entrance while his friend went into Jonah's room, where he took the tool from her and caused harm, resulting in the unfortunate event. This account also didn't convince the police. No fingerprints or DNA of other individuals were found at the scene, making the involvement of someone else unlikely. The detectives were waiting for the trial to commence, but fate had a different plan. On March 28, 2008, Taylor Olson took his own life in his detention cell. Notes were found beside him, addressed to his family, Jonah's relatives, and the police. In the letter to the detectives, he once again claimed that his friend Noah Cox was the actual person responsible and apologized to Jonah's family and his own. The detectives continued to believe that Olson was the one behind the incident. However, they repeatedly questioned Noah, but no proof of his involvement could be discovered. Jonah's parents also believed that he was lying. In their view, if Taylor was truly innocent, he wouldn't have taken such a drastic step. It was much more likely that he simply didn't want to spend his entire life in prison. Moreover, for several months after his initial admission, Olson continued to maintain that he acted alone and no one else was present with him. If he was trying to protect his friend, why did he suddenly change his statement and start accusing him of the incident? Share your thoughts on this story in the comments, and don't forget to like this video.